Got content for the one where Emilius drew power and the betrayal you missed in the enemy. The betrayal? Who betrayed who? Juice accidentally stabbing Fortuna is considered betrayal? No, this is cut content stuff. There's even more content. Okay, let's see, Mr. Any News. First time in over 40 episodes, we finally got a glimpse into Amelia's true potential. It was such an astounding display of power mm. that even Echidna couldn't help but comment on how Pandora was completely outmatched by it. That is crazy. We've seen in Frozen Bond of how strong Amelia really is, right? Because of her ice attacks is clearly... It's just blooming and it like takes all the blood away out of a single injury. But a child self stripped Pandora in simple terms of power, right? This is simple terms of power. I don't think Child Amelia can beat Pandora because she just seemingly just changes reality itself. But Amelia, for all we've seen so far, that's a nerfed version of Amelia. But with such an immense affinity for magic, there also came the issue of not being able to control it, mm -hmm. resulting in an outburst of mana on a scale that we've only ever seen once before. Memory Snow. So let's take a look at that. Plus but that was more of Puck's Ode overflowing, right? This is not anything to do with Amelia, unless Memory Snow fucking lied to me, and there was more secrets, and this is actually not related to Puck at all. As before. So let's take a look at that, plus all the other excluded details as we go through the cut content for this episode. Let's begin. Well, first. Episode 44. No ad. The Eternal Freezing of the Great Elior Forest. Covering chapters 4 and 5 from volume 14 of the light novel. Starting from the end of last episode, Pandora's initial encounter with Amelia put a significant emphasis on her excitement. There was a genuine expression of joy that could be seen on her face when Amelia said that she was going to open the seal. She Baited. looked as if she could barely contain her impatience anymore. It was a far different look from what we'd seen from her in the earlier encounters. On the other hand, Amelia's mind began to empty as she became overcome by feelings of fear and despair, eventually getting to the point where she was willing to use just about anything to escape the predicament she was in. So, when Pandora gave her exactly what she was looking for, Amelia was able to easily accept what should have been nothing more than an incomprehensible statement. Give me the key. I mean, there wasn't really much else she could do other than try to make sense of the words Pandora gave her. So, that's exactly what she did. Now, one interesting thing to note about when Amelia produced Boom. the key was that Pandora mentioned how there were likely only two people in the world that could hold it. Two people! But Amelia's not the only one that can have the key. Yet, Pandora being here means that the other person, it's too hard to reach them. Maybe they don't even exist anymore. Unlike in the anime, this implies that there's one other person besides Amelia who possesses the proper qualifications to even- <laughs> Wait, wait, wait! Even I know- Other person- Subaru? Besides Felt? Besides Amelia who- uh, Wilhelm? Possesses the proper- That's the Overlord guy! That's the dude with the gl- I know this, because he uses this guy all the time and just cut content. He fucking- Alright, it's, it's the Overlord guy, guys. That, that's, that's the key. For qualifications to even see it. It's a particular detail that I think alludes to something bigger, mm. which is probably why it didn't make it into the anime. Who else could have the key? Well, the fact that, um, like, Pandora is here and not somewhere else with that person implies that the person is already dead. Maybe they're alive, but there's just somewhere that Pandora even herself cannot reach. Who could that person be? Why is Amelia the one? Should we go with Subaru being also the key guys? Should we, should we go with the whole Amelia and Subaru are actually related based on that one line of like Fortuna's like, you know, family side and Amelia having those like mean eyes that Subaru's mom also has? Should we go with that? Subaru is also the key somehow? <laughs> I don't know. Didn't make it into the anime. In any case, there was something about the key that really seemed to resonate with Amelia. What? It was as if she already knew exactly what it was meant for. Yeah, because she's the chosen one for the key, so I'm sure there's some sort of subconscious connection there. Not only that, but just holding the key was an experience that felt very natural to her. Mm. It felt like an object that she'd used many times before. Almost like it was something she could have been using to open up her own bedroom. Hmm. Contrary to how Amelia felt though, it was quite obvious that the seal hadn't been opened in a very long time. Even the novels went so far as to describe it as this object that has been carrying out a long, long duty. If she put the key in the keyhole and it will open, then open it would. 
That was all it would take for the seal to be released from its long, long, truly. So, okay, I get it. I, <laughs> okay, I get it. It's a very long, it's been a very long time now. What kind of duty? What is the duty? Well, now we pretty much know that this specific seal doesn't, isn't related to Satala directly, maybe indirectly, if this is a seal for the seal of Satala, because we know that seal exists in some kind of desert place, and this is not. This area is supposedly some kind of like territory outside the laws of the regular world. The duty? I don't know. It truly just boggles my mind. For whatever reason, a kid nut said this is Minerva's graveyard. And I'm like, how the fuck would you ever come to that conclusion as an anime only? Because obviously he's not anime only and he's just fucking inserting his own knowledge that he's seen from the web novel and the light novel. That is an insane fucking jump of logic for one to assume. That like, this out of fucking nowhere Minerva gets mentioned, it's like, Oh, oh, how could I have known? Of course it was Minerva all this time! Oh fuck it, Emilia's mom is also Minerva, guys! Oh my god! Like, how the fuck? How the fuck? Am I supposed to even reach that? There's not enough evidence shown in the anime with the cut content to suggest anything. But simply Minerva just being thrown out, I'm just gonna throw that shit out too. Fuck it. Minerva's graveyard, Minerva is Amelia's mom, Minerva is fucking Fortuna's sister then? Does that fucking make sense? So, we can only imagine how much of that time Pandora has spent trying to open it. As Amelia hesitated to do just that though, we get to the point where she was then offered the two choices of different hopes. To the right was the hope that kept her promise, mm. and to the left was Break the hope it. that broke it. Amelia was free to choose whichever one she thought was best. The decision itself was much harder for her than what we were shown though, the entire time she was thinking about it. Her very sense of self was degrading into nothing but her consciousness alone. The sound around her was slowly dissipating from her ears. Oh. And any color she- That was kind of cool, and he's also just removed the decibels in his voice. Could see was fading itself out of perception. The only thing that remained was the single thought of how she was unable to choose. Eventually, she did come to a conclusion, though. That's a really hard choice for a childlike Amelia. You have to also realize that she's extremely slow on top of being a child. So like, you have one option, break the promise and potentially save the people here, or don't break the promise and everyone dies. But it's like, a child has to choose between the two? I'm glad that she stuck to her guns and didn't break the promise though. An answer that was guided solely by the teachings of her mother. That alone was the only hope she ever needed. And here's another thing, right? Like, fuck. Like, look at this girl. Hold up. Let me get a picture of her. Bro, I, I don't see pointy ears here. I do not see pointy ears here, guys. This is clearly not an elf. It's an adopted sister! Oh my god! Whoa! It's an adopted sister, guys! So, oh my god! It, 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 Minerva is actually Fortuna's adopted sister, therefore... It, <laughs> no. No. But you're right. But Amelia's mom is not an elf. I'm getting ahead of myself. You're right, Fortuna's brother's the father. Where is the kid not going with this? Where? Hmm. Hmm. Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! There, there's no logical inconsistency here. She, she, the, the mom is not supposed to be the sibling to Fortuna. The adopted bullshit. No, it doesn't need to happen. But why? How? Why would one ever assume such a thing? Based on the material that's been presented so far, that's just such a fucking hard thing for me to reason out because there's not enough information. Another interesting theory. You know how Puck... You know how we haven't seen Puck yet? Yet, Puck talks as if, like, he was too late to find Amelia in the beginning of Frozen Bond. Like... What if... Amelia's dad is Puck? I'm thinking, because, like... We made the schizo theory that Fortuna is Puck 
based on a stupid lineup. Oh my god! Fortuna said Leah at the end. Oh, that nickname! Only Puck has ever said it. Therefore, it must be Puck. But it's like, that is such a hard reach. That, that's such a crazy fucking reach. But if we're going to be reaching around, why not assume, like, because Puck is supposed to be like a father, right? What if, I don't know, so, like, Fortuna's brother, right, is actually Puck. As a spirit form now? After he died somehow? I don't know. Can an elf die and then the soul just then turn into a fucking spirit? I have no clue how that shit works, but maybe both siblings called Amelia and Leah. So I'm just trying to like figure out how does like Pug come into the story? It, it truly boggles my mind. I don't know. I have no clue. By the teachings of her mother, that alone was the only hope she ever needed. So, it was with those teachings in mind that Amelia chose the hand on the right. And when she did, she became surprised by Pandora's apparent acceptance of her decision. I mean, Pandora definitely could have used her power to force Amelia to do as she asked. But the very fact that she didn't showed that there must have been at least a little bit of goodness deep within her. What this really was, though, was nothing more than a compassionate facade. Yes, Pandora was going to respect Amelia's decision. But that didn't mean that she was going to respect anything else. She had absolutely no problems with destroying anything she personally didn't find valuable or worthy of respect. So that pretty much meant the entire forest. Okay. Because Amelia was one of the people she was fond of though, Pandora had actually acted in a way that looked as if she intended to protect her. You see, when Fortuna appeared from the forest and launched her attack, she wasn't yet aware that Amelia was there as well. Oh, really? So, it was very possible that Amelia could have been caught in the crossfire. Had well, yeah, to, because to Fortuna, I mean, sorry, to Pandora, right? Amelia is important because she is the seal. I mean, she, she is, you know, the source of the key. Well, so it was very possible that Amelia could have been caught in the crossfire had Pandora not stepped up like how she did. The novel doesn't explicitly say that this was her intent. As if to shield Amelia. As if. But I think that it makes sense. I don't think Pandora is saving Amelia out of sentimental effort. No, I, I think it's just she's a tool. Pandora needs Amelia. Amelia is a very important tool. Therefore, I will protect in case that she gets hit. But it does make the implication. Anyway, the anime did a really good job adapting Pandora's death montage. They were pretty much as graphic as the novel described them to be. Then, the following moments between Amelia and Fortuna were identical as well. Where the anime starts to leave out a couple details is after Juice mistakenly attacks Fortuna. No, the Juice! The strike itself felt inherently different from the ones he's tried to give before. Hmm? That's why he was so sure that this was the time his attack finally went through. What does that mean? He attacks Fortuna. The strike itself felt inherently different from the ones he's tried to give before. Okay. That's why he was so sure that this was the time his attack finally went through. Because it felt As different. As Amelia stumbled over <laughs> but to it was actually Fortuna. now lay. The first thing she tried to do was keep Fortuna's silver hair clean. She wanted to keep it as pretty and unblemished as it always was. Aww. But the pool of blood that was spreading into the ends of it was preventing that from happening. And now, it all makes sense. Juice's, like, projection of what he did to Rem in episode 15. Remember how he was telling Subaru? You killed her, bro. You did this. After he fucking twisted her. To kind of like show like, yeah, back in the day, Juice killed Fortuna. He killed a person that he loved. And now that gets reflected in episode 15 when Super didn't do it. He was just being slothful and inactive because he was fucking mentally broken. But then he was like, you did it. You did this. It also didn't help that Amelia's fingers were covered with blood as well. The more she tried to brush the blood away. The more blotched Fortuna's hair would become as the action just served to spread it even more. Now, when Juice came to the realization of who it was he really struck, the sheer shock of it caused him to dig his fingernails straight into his cheeks. He then dragged those same mm. fingers down his face with so much- Yeah, now we know all the mannerisms, right? Now we know the insanity that is Juice, right? All these things, it makes sense now. And what's interesting, as I remember in Season 1, Episode 15, that- you know how, like, Juice is gaslighting Subaru Sin, like, dude, you're not insane. Don't lie to me. You're like, I, I, I am truly insane. You're just acting insane. But then we talked about how there's, like, a spectrum, and Juice is basically challenger rank ELO in terms of insanity, and Subaru is just, like, just starting out. Therefore, he is just fucking, you know, just crying and just going crazy like that. I mean, 
We also see a Juice back then who was kind of like Subaru in terms of like the... Like, like I doubt the Juice in episode 15 would look back at this Juice and say the same thing, you know? Shock of it caused him to dig his fingernails straight into his cheeks. He then dragged those same fingers down his face with so much force that not only did it gouge out his flesh, but it also stripped the nails right off his fingers. His whole face was now covered in blood as he slowly succumbed to the madness instilled by the incompatible witch factor. The only reason he'd been able to maintain his sanity for so long was simply due to his own willpower. Will. But now that the most important thing keeping that willpower intact was gone, now he's going so loco. too was his ability to maintain himself and the deadly sin inside him. That's right, and there's a lot of fucking arguments on the YouTube comment sections of people claiming they know what the fuck they're talking about, and people also misrepresenting what the source material is. Juice is not compatible with the witch factor. That's why he went crazy. But he's still very powerful. The unseen hands is way fucking better than the invisible providence. The compatibility and actually the... What's the word? Proficiency with the actual authorities? There, seem, there doesn't seem to be a correlation, which is so extremely fucking troll. It's just Nagatsuki Tape just does everything in his power to always just like misdirect the audience and always make you assume things that just logically make sense and then twist it. Why the fuck would incompatibility like or compat like wouldn't you think that if someone's more compatible that their powers would also fucking scale with it? It's so fucking stupid. But that's what's happening right now, where even if he's incompatible, the authority's power is very strong for Jews. For Subaru, on the other hand, and this is the and this is the best part. Motherfuckers say that Super is also incompatible, but actually, it's like, he is compatible. And then the argument is, well, he's compatible with it, but not that much. What does that mean? You're telling me that he's compatible, but not that much. You're basically telling me he's incompatible. I'm not saying that this is like a, a binary or true or false, but there's a spectrum of compatibility in this. Right? <laughs> Do I need to fucking bring this shit out? Like, if there is a fucking spectrum of compatible and not, right? Where fucking, you know, this is like... Checkmark, it's good. And here, it's bad, right? So, so basically, like, Regulus? Oh, yeah. Regulus is fucking chilling. Let's get a picture here. Regulus, ReZero. Let's get a picture of Regulus out. Regulus is compatible, right? I think I can assume that. Where's the picture? Come on. Copy. Boom. Too big. Regulus is, like, here. Right? Super compatible. Super compatible. And then you have, like, Subaru. Right? Juice. The compatibility seems to do with the insanity of a person. I don't know. Maybe I'm capping, but knowing this fucking show, I don't ever fucking know what I'm talking about. Juice is like... Here. No, Juice is like, here. He's like, actually incompatible. He went fucking nuts! Also, his whole theme of like, diligence and stuff. His personality trait, right? Also seems to not really matter. And then, here's Natsuki Subaru. And Subaru is like... I don't know, maybe somewhere like here, right? This is what people are telling me. In terms of a fucking line, a spectrum of what is compatible and what is not, Regulus is very compatible. Better Goose is very uncompatible. But Subaru, he is compatible, but to a lesser degree, right? That's basically what's going on, to a lesser degree. It's just the word of incompatibility is such an absolute that people don't think of this in terms of like a spectrum of how much or how less. But this is what's going on, and it does not matter because, like, this motherfucker, very strong, right? Powerful. Powerful. Right? These two. Even though they're on the opposite spectrum, their authorities doesn't seem to matter. The, the authority has nothing to do with the compatibility because this motherfucker can only use one single tiny hand. I don't know, man. That's, that, that's basically where we're at with the authorities and, like, compatibilities and fucking <laughs> the powers. So, this was the moment when the person that was Jusa disappeared forever. What remained was simply the broken mind of a being obsessed by love. Switching back to Amelia, there were several thoughts going through her head as she held her dying mother. 
The first was the upsetting feeling that came with the realization of how much lighter she'd become. You see, so much blood had spilled from the initial wound that there wasn't much left to continue leaking from her body. But the very fact the bleeding had stopped only went to make Amelia think that perhaps the wound was healing. She couldn't help but wonder if this was a sign that her mother was getting better now. As the only thing to come from Fortuna was her steady flow of tears, Amelia tried her best to gather them up as she believed them to be the only thing remaining of her mother's life force. But the more she watched this unfamiliar sight of her mother shed tears and cry for forgiveness, Too sad. the more she came to realize that the light had already faded from her eyes. She did. She now understood that Fortuna could neither see, hear, nor feel anything around her. She wasn't even able to acknowledge the fact that Amelia was the person holding her. If teardrops truly did carry the power of life like how Amelia believed, though, then it was most definitely her own that brought about what could only be considered a miracle. Teardrops? I mean, Fortuna coming life? back to her senses was something that should have been impossible. So perhaps it really was Amelia's tears that made it happen. Wait, wait, what the fuck are we talking about here with Amelia's belief that a teardrop has life force? Are you, are you serious right now? Hello? <laughs> okay? I feel like that was such a random thing to throw in there that seems very important. <laughs> the, the witch's tear of life, I don't know. Perhaps this really was what allowed them to be able to share that one final moment together. Uh, maybe there's nothing too deep about this. Or maybe this is a very important mechanic where Amelia's tear <laughs> will one day fucking resurrect Subaru. I don't know. <laughs> because Fortuna could now acknowledge that Amelia was there it made for the moment she lost her life to become that much more apparent. Amelia could immediately tell when it happened because her mother's body got even lighter. She knew that something that should never come out had now left forever. It was after Pandora came to request that the seal be opened again that Amelia finally started to make sense of everything. She was now beginning to understand exactly why the demon in front of her had acted the way that she did. Demon! Once everything had been pieced together. She was able to see that Pandora had acted with the sole purpose of getting her to break her promise. Yeah. That was the only reason behind her mother's death and everything else. And the twisted thing is, this girl actually thought this made sense. To a robot, she's approaching this like math. If he... Oh, well, shit. There, there's a constraint. There's a problem. Amelia has a promise with her mom. If I get rid of the mom, then the promise doesn't exist. Therefore, Amelia will, you know, open the door. Oh, it makes sense to me, right? No normal person thinks like that because they'd understand that the simple action of taking away the mom, while it may destroy the promise, like it doesn't mean that a person will simply uh, forego that promise. In fact, they may resent you even more to further show that this girl is a fucking witch. She does not understand human logic, love, not even just human because these are like half elves, right? And, and elves, right? It's just like, she doesn't understand, because she's a fucking witch. It's a revelation that leads us into Pandora's second death montage. But before we get into this display of Amelia's true power, there was one final thing that Pandora revealed that served to send Amelia over the edge. What's up? And that was the involvement of the lesser spirits she so fondly called fairies. Evil. Right in front of Amelia's eyes, Pandora had summoned the very same spirits that Amelia had used to find the seal. At first, Amelia was confused as to why they were now on Pandora's side. But the truth of the matter was that they were never on her side to begin That's with. That's right, baited. You see, Pandora had ordered the lesser spirits to help Amelia find the seal. And I guess the lesser spirits don't really have a will of their own. I don't really think that they're in a position to defy Pandora. So it's not really that these lesser spirits are evil. It's just like, what the hell am I supposed to do against Pandora? They didn't exactly force her to go there, but they did help in persuading her that doing so would be a good idea. So, this entire time Amelia was pretty much being manipulated. As she tried to come to terms with what that meant, she also prepared herself for the rampage she was about to go on. The hair clip. Starting it off with the sculpture of ice and death that we saw in the end. So like... Do you think that this hairpin matters? I don't think so. It's not like, oh, she put the hairpin on and her power is now activated, right? The hairpin being clipped on is simply Amelia moving forward as Fortuna has passed away and now Amelia's taken the hair clip as a important memory piece, right? To remind herself who her mother was. Not the real biological mother, but you know, the fucking Fortuna. But then these powers just show up, right? These ice blooming shit. And I remember in Frozen Bond that you needed an injury, right? 
there was like a cut, some sort of visible wound, and then these ice blooms would come out and start sucking the blood out of that person and just drain them and just kill them. Here, it just shows up out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Does that matter? Is there an important mechanic at play here? I got no clue. That we saw in the anime. The next was the stakes of ice that pinned each of Pandora's limbs to the ground. And that was followed by a barrage of attacks from both below and above that would shatter her body into pieces. As for the rest of it, well, that was pretty much as we saw. Every subsequent fatality was becoming more violently creative than the last. But every time Amelia activated one of these icy spells of death, her body would get closer and closer to its limits. Hmm. So she was basically casting magic that her body wasn't capable of supporting, making it so that every spell only went to strain herself more and more. What exactly was happening, though, was that Amelia was taking in mana at a rate beyond what she could handle. Yes, this did allow her to attack with significant power and speed, but these attacks weren't enough to completely expel all the mana she was taking in. Okay. If you've ever seen the Memory Snow OVA, then you'd know that this is a state similar to the one that we saw Puck in. You see, despite Amelia or Puck's very high capacity for mana, they do have some sort of limit to the amount they can carry. The container. And it's when they reach that limit that the mana starts to leak from their body Old. in a form of magic. That's why the mansion became frozen in the OVA. That's and right. It's why the forest was becoming frozen right here and now. Even Pandora couldn't help but acknowledge Amelia's innate ability. She commented on both her capacity for mana and gate that could manage it. But what was even more interesting was the line that came after. Whoa, whoa, whoa. A statement that all but confirmed Amelia's limit. It was Simo, which is progeny, cannot flee from fate. Okay, what, what does progeny mean? These are big words for my monkey brain. Progeny. Progeny is a descendant or descendant of a person. Well, they call her immediately the witch's daughter, right? So it's a similar thing. Cannot flee from fates. Perhaps you were brought to this forest to make sure your blood continued to slumber. Because Amelia's dangerous. Cannot flee from fate. Did a similar thing happen to her mom? I don't know. It seems like flee from a witch's progeny cannot flee from fate. Perhaps you were brought to this force to make sure your blood continued to stumber. As in like, yes, right now what happened? Amelia seemingly is locked up in this forest and she's been quote unquote like sealed away. Well, she's frozen herself because her powers been preserved because she's too dangerous to blood. But this doesn't just... It's not limited to Amelia, and now we can go up uh, like a, to Amelia's ancestors, right? Because she is the progeny. She is a witch's daughter. And, and the people above that family tree line and that blood, too, has also suffered the same fate. You know what? Um, what episode is Witch's Tea Party? Hold up. I want to bring this up. 3-0 Tea Party Season 2. Was it episode 12? It's the one where uh, Minerva shows up. Both. I want, I want both. Episode 12 and 13. I, I want both. There's two encounters. There's, there's two separate ones, right? Let's see it. Is this the one where Minerva exists? Yes. It is. I, I want to find an exact line of like when she fucking uh, talks about Amelia's mom apparently. Oh, sorry, let me just uh, resize this thing. Boom. Minerva. Yeah. Yeah, 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 pieces of evidence as to why Echidna would ever mention, like, mother and seal. I don't think I'm gonna be able to find it. I don't know. Mm, no, this is all the one where they're trying to prevent Subaru from, like, you know, uh, taking the contract. So maybe it's not episode 12. Maybe it's episode 9? Let's check it out. All right, let's check it out. Mm. This is when Tifon breaks Subaru, right? And then Minerva shows up and... Minerva doesn't mention any mother? 
So you're telling me that I got gaslit by a random chatter? Where they said Minerva mentioned Amelia's mom? Go fuck yourself. Neage as the daughter of a witch. Though it was a comment that Amelia herself couldn't understand. She still went on to reject it just like how she was doing with every other part of Pandora. The result was an even more uncontrollable outburst of mana. A veritable snowstorm that was increasing in strength with every passing second. Eventually reaching a level- That's in future episodes? Of season 2? Or are we talking season 3 content? Are you, say are you saying that's in future episodes for- Is it, is it, is it season 2 content? Okay. Okay, so overly excited ReZero retards continuously just ruining my entire experience by thinking that they're helping the content out at the end of the day. Their stupidity is just making me more upset. Honestly, this is fun content too. Me just fucking getting mad at retards. <laughs> I'm perfect. It's just... <laughs> Here's the thing. Everybody, at the end of the day, this comes from a place of loving ReZero. ReZero is their favorite series. They've read ahead of the light novel. They've read ahead in the web novel. They fucking love it. And they're excited that there is finally someone covering ReZero out of depth that hasn't been seen before on YouTube. Maybe there has been, but I think it's pretty rare that someone would go this fucking deep into a show. But those same people want to enjoy the content along with the creator and want their acknowledgement to be shown in the content by saying in this shit. They, they usually comment this bullshit in the chat trying as if they're fucking guiding me at, 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 at the end of the day. That's pretty much spoilers, right? The entire fun of the content is me walking down a tunnel without knowing what the fuck is going on and trying to make schizo theories. But quite often, random people will try to guide me in a direction to like feel like oh hey because because you know they they want me to get to the fucking answer you know they they want me to get to the answer therefore it is the way it is there's nothing i can do about it it's simple human nature all i can do is really just get mad at those retards and make fun of them and make good content out of it that's it full of power that would cover the entire forest in a layer of permanent ice now to give context as to i think the most important shit here was this part right this is fucking crazy this is fucking crazy it seems like Amelia's bloodline association with the witch, the witch of envy, I don't know, but Amelia and her ancestors, right? It's, it's important that they keep <laughs> the world like hidden from them, or, or rather keep, the, keep them hidden from the world by making them slumber. Is this force specifically important? I don't know, but this, this is a very important line. Witch's progeny cannot flee from fate as in this is another iteration and another cycle meaning Emilia's ancestors also suffered the same fate where their blood continued to slumber by basically just you know freezing them away or like sealing them away something just to remove them from the equation now to give context as to what exactly pandora did to Emilia here she fun fact i know this is completely off tangent i just saw the 1000 bottles of baby oil so i'm gonna bring it up right now because i saw a random tweet the 1000 bottles of baby oil at the freak offs at Diddy's mansion the police didn't take away the baby oil because it was baby oil. It's implied that it was laced with drugs so that you put it, you slather it on and you get a high off of that. Because like, why would they confiscate just fucking baby Johnson's baby oil, right? They laced the baby oil. <laughs> the freak offs where they douse themselves in baby oil and they get like super hot. Like it's basically like, um, like THC rubs, you know, there's like balms or like um, CBD shit. You rub it on and then due to your, you can actually absorb um, through your skin. There's like porous membranes and it goes into your bloodstream. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's the lore of the baby oil. Anyway, completely off topic. Let's get back to ReZero. Basically used her power to make it so that Amelia would forget her very existence. It was an action that caused all of Amelia's memories to begin rearranging themselves. So who did this though? In the layer of Pandora ice. did, right? Now. To give context as to what exactly Pandora did to Amelia here. Mm. She basically used her power to make it so that Amelia would forget her very existence. That's right. It was an action that caused all of Amelia's memories to begin rearranging themselves. Almost like pages of a book were being torn out then reinserted in areas that didn't belong. So it's not like she's burning the book, it's just everything is out of order and Amelia's confused. What remained at the end was a mind full of inconsistencies that Amelia couldn't even begin to wrap her head around. The love she'd been granted her entire life was slowly starting to vanish. And what was emerging in its place was this inexplicable feeling of fear and looming sense of guilt. That said, there was one thing that remained clear in her- I'm not gonna lie guys, the entirety of the episode, you know what I was thinking about? That the blood on her face just resembled ketchup.
the viscosity of this blood just it just reminds me of like Amelia ketchup on her face. I'm sorry. Said, there was one thing that remained clear in her memory after everything was done. And that was the fact that she kept her promise. She didn't know what the promise was for or who it was with, but she was well Fortuna's aware that she promise. didn't break it. That's right. So this was the last thing she could hold on to as the ice slowly overtook her body, leaving her in a frozen sleep that would span for exactly 100 years. Yeah, and then Puck finds her. But Puck has seemingly never interacted with Amelia at this point, at least from the memories that we've seen so far. What does that hint at? Puck is still overseeing Amelia from a long, long distance away with that actual connection? I don't know. How old is Puck? I don't know. Puck mentioned that Puck's dialogue with Betra Goose is very important too, about how if you're going to contest me, you need at least half of what Satala could do, implying that Puck knows of Satala and her true powers because they never, they, maybe they fought. I don't know. But that, at least that's one data point to suggest that Puck existed pre-Calamity days, meaning spanning 400 plus years ago. I don't think Fortuna is Puck. That doesn't really make sense because Fortuna is not that old. I don't know how old Fortuna's brother is though. That, that's, that's where it gets kind of interesting. So now we're trying to figure out people that existed 400 years ago. To be... no, that, no, but that means that... No, no. Yeah, no, 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 it, it means that Puck didn't need to be in that cat spirit form back in the day, pre-Calamity. Puck could have been perhaps Amelia's dad, just alive. Would they live for that long? I don't fucking know, I'm just, I'm just trying to fucking think. I'm just trying to... What the hell is Puck? Some people said Archie. I don't think Archie really makes sense either, due to that one, you know, t the timeline inconsistency. Like, Archie is younger than... Fortuna, bro. We've already discarded Fortuna because of the comments about the Satala stuff, so... I don't know, man. I don't know, man. As the novel goes on to state, it was a century-long slumber that would only end after a certain spirit would find her. Mm. A spirit who had received life for the sake of only her. A spirit whose existence was dedicated to finding this- When did Puck say he didn't used to have fur? Because that's just like more evidence that, yeah, Puck was- you know, not a fucking cat spirit for all of his life. He just became one at a certain point into his timeline, and he existed pre-fucking Calamity Days. Was it like episode one? Season one, episode one? Was, was it something like fucking when Pug turned into a giant cat and Super had a lap pillow there? Did he say something there? When did, he, when did Pug say he didn't used to have fur? When did he say that? That kind of sounds familiar, but it's such a random fucking line. Aww. That, that might be like episode one, season one. I don't know. Maybe you're just fucking Mandela affecting me right now. Everyone's just fucking gaslighting me. This girl. Until that time would come though. Amelia would remain here. And his limbs weren't short? Listen, if it's actually true that Puck said that he didn't have fur and his limbs weren't short, then it's pretty much implied that yes, Puck was... Uh, some sort of like humanoid, not necessarily a human race, but some sort of humanoid like an elf too. I don't know, but uh, let's keep that in mind. Here alone in this icy landscape of her own creation. In the post-trial discussion, Echidna had a little bit more to say about the person she identified as the Witch of Vanity. It would seem that she carried envy, right? In the post-trial discussion, Echidna had a little bit more to say about the person she identified as the Witch of Vanity. It would seem that she which of Ante? No, I think that was the pronunciation mistake. He's saying Envy here, right? The person she identified as the Witch of Ante. It would seem that she carried quite a bit of disdain towards her. The first thing she noted was... Was that Vanity? It's... It, it, he, he said Ante. Vanity. I'm gonna go with Vanity here. How Pandora had used her ability to rewrite phenomena to change Amelia's memories. Okay. Basically confirming that that's what the Authority of Vanity did. Rewriting phenomena. Change Amelia's memories. Basically confirming that that's what the Authority of Vanity did. But here's the thing. The Authority of Vanity rewriting phenomena? But what- Cause like, here's the thing, right? And... We kn <laughs> You know how like, um, she, she can just rewrite the script? She can just send Regulus away? She can just fucking do all that shit? But she can't just say, open the seal? 
like the seal will just open before me, I, Pandora. And in that one echidna video, I was right before he flashed that frame passage of talking about how this territory was a lawless place. I made the claim of like, maybe there's limitations to our power here for specifically the seal in this area because it exists outside the laws of this world and our authority only works within the confines of the laws of this world. And then Echidna fucking flashed that passage to kind of hint that, like that, that is why that's the case. Now, maybe he's not confirming, maybe he's just fucking memeing with us too. But I then asked the question, would she die in this area if Fortuna fucking icicled her? She did get icicled. She came back to life. But I think that there's many different powers at display here. And maybe still, at the end of the day, her true authority isn't really like what's being displayed. You know, I, we didn't see Pandora use the same skill on Regulus by saying this line and then that phenomena happening. But she did rewrite Amelia's memories, which, and, and Anonymous is saying this may be the authority of fucking Vanity, which means that the authority does now, is working in this lawless state, then why cannot she fucking do something with the seal? Maybe the seal is just so incomprehensibly different that her authority is limited, or we were just not seeing it. I don't know. And maybe there's some limits. If we think about like, what? Change the events and actions, but not affect places or objects? I don't know. There's a lot of weird things going on. But there's another thing too, yes. Cause like, I was thinking, how the hell did she come back to life? But it's like, did she actually die? The existence of Pandora is so troll. If you've seen Bleach, and if you know Aizen, you know exactly what I'm talking about. An existence of a character like this, suddenly gives so much power of bullshittery to the author where you can see people die, you can see horrific things happening, then what the fucking snap? You can just simply say, since when were you the, under the impression that these people actually died? But you were seeing illusions. <laughs> it's like, oh wow, the pinnacle of writing. You fucking gaslit the audience, show them exactly um, people dying and stuff, and, and then you can just say, uh, no, uh. No, -uh, I can just change reality. Great. Great. Fantastic. It's exactly what a show like ReZero needed. It, as if things weren't mysterious and fucking hard enough to understand because Tape is going out of his way to always misdirect and fucking always gaslight his audience and even lie to them in Q&As. You create a bullshit character like this, which now goes further beyond of just like rewriting the script imaginable. It, it, it's, it's, it's just fantastic. Though it was definitely a noteworthy ability, Echidna personally found it to be quite distasteful. She despised everything about it and the person who possessed it. Like now, because I was thinking last night too. Let me go to the bathroom. I, I let me cook. I I can't think properly when I, I need to go take a piss. There's an interesting thing about Pandora and her ability to just like make illusions and make it seem like Juice is attacking Pandora but it was fortunate at the time and making people see hallucinations or whatnot. Here's the thing. If we're gonna go with the theory that Satala had a lover that resembles Subaru but like died due to whatever unfair thing happened in the world and then consumed the other witches to fake basically get revenge. And then at that time, her incompatibility with the witch factors is how the separate personality of Witch of Envy was created that just destroyed the world. It feels like the driving force of this show is Pandora gaslighting Satella. You know what I mean? I don't think it's necessarily... Like, like I think Satella got manipulated through illusion powers through Pandora. Got manipulated, got gaslit into thinking her lover died or some shit and she needs to enact revenge. Like Something like that I think is... Definitely feasible now. It's like, 
Satala is the victim. All she wanted to do was have love and it was taken away by Pandora because Pandora just wants to watch Burn? I don't know. What's even more interesting than that though was Echidna's comparison of Amelia's power to Pandora's. According to her, Amelia's younger self was far stronger than Pandora in pretty much every way. Just power though. Because Pandora doesn't really... Well, I... <laughs> We don't know if she doesn't die, it's just simply maybe we're just not seeing the right Pandora. Maybe Pandora's not even here right now and we're just seeing fucking illusions of her. I don't know. And that was because Pandora's ability was a bad matchup against Amelia's strengths. Just... why? What is Amelia's strength? Just brute forcing with ice? Or is there something beyond this? Because I, I feel like... If we're talking brute force, then yeah. But could... could not... I don't know. What, what, why specifically Amelia? Because like, what is she doing special here? She's just freezing shit. She's extremely powerful. The strength that, that that's it, right? Fortuna too. She's very powerful in ice. Maybe not to the same degree as Amelia, but what does this really imply? There was a significant disparity in terms of raw power that made Pandora unable to beat Amelia. Just raw power? That's the difference here? It just, it's just actually just raw power? No. After Amelia had accepted the fact that she was the reason for this frozen forest, she also came to understand why it was she'd spent every day talking to the statues of ice. She now knew that it was out of a subconscious feeling of guilt that made her want to atone for her sins. When it came time for Amelia to give her answer to the trial, most of the back and forth with Echidna was pretty much the same. Amelia declared with all her heart that she was going to create the ideal world that her mother envisioned for everyone. After she was done though, Echidna began to compare Amelia to the likes of her mother, not the one that had heart that she was going to create the ideal world that her mother envisioned for everyone. Fortuna here. After she was done though, Echidna began to compare Amelia to the likes of her mother, mm -hmm. not the one that had cared for her as she was growing up. Though. Biological! Instead she was talking about the one that Amelia had never met before. Who is she? You see, all the harsh words that she'd just used to describe Amelia were the exact same ones that she'd used to describe her real mother. Identical. Okay. Anything else? So, it was in that regard that she found the two of them to be very similar. Okay. As you'd expect, this sudden topic of Amelia's mother went to catch Amelia by surprise. I'm just trying to like think- I'm, I'm, again, now I'm walking backwards on how Minerva could be like this. Is Minerva a loose woman who's selfish? Is she, is she hypocritical? There's that one example where Minerva told Subaru, Don't hurt yourself something! There was that one, there was that one case during the tea party where Minerva told Subaru about her ideals, about like, you're just being selfish, blah blah blah, don't hurt others, and then she ended up just breaking that in immediately. But just a simple example of hypocrisy, I don't think is enough to fucking portray the personality traits that's sh shared between Amelia and her. I don't know leading her to ask Echidna if she truly did know her real mother. Who is she? It was a question to which Echidna replied saying that she did. Not only that, but she also said that the reason she gets so emotional when talking to Amelia is partly due to the relationship she had with her mother. What's the relationship you have with her mother? I mean, and Echidna really hates Amelia. Amelia? Echidna fucking hates Satala too, right? Satala, Amelia, and Amelia's mom. If we're going to assume that Satala is Amelia's mom, I'm, I'm willing to entertain that thought. Fuck it, why not? I'm also willing to entertain the thought that <laughs> Satala and Amelia are twin sisters! And then you're going to ask me, how does that make sense, bro? Satala existed such a long time ago! You ready? You think that this is the first time Amelia was frozen? Nah, bro. Fuck this author, bro. This this dumbass author could have done some bullshit of pre-freezing Amelia. That's right. Uh-huh. The, the Amelia that you see in this flashback is not consistent with the timeline. That bitch also got frozen a long time ago. <laughs> I am so down. <laughs> I am so down to just believe that bullshit too. And then she got thought out as a toddler in these pre-frozen Vaughn memories. And then she got frozen again to just obfuscate and just troll the audience. And ugh, just motherfucker. Ugh. There was something about her envious attitude that Echidna wasn't entirely fond of. Ah, envious! She gets so emotional when talking to Amelia. It's partly due to the relationship she had with her mother. 
There was something about her envious attitude that Echidna wasn't entirely fond of. Ooh, envious! Witch of envy! Satula! Satula must be Amelia's mom! I refuse to believe that. It's too simple. It's way too simple for a show like this. Unless the author is then just trolling and making us just think like 17 layers of abstraction when at the end of the day it truly was just level 1 just answer. And it's just like, gotcha! You motherfucker were too distracted and caught up in the moment with me giving you so much mysteries when the answer was actually that simple. Oh, you got me, bro! This was the last thing the two discussed before parting ways at the end of the trial. In the moments after Amelia awoke in the tomb. The carving she put her hand over was the one that said I love you. But the exact character her face landed on when she began to shed her tears was the one that stood for love. I... Now, the only reason she hadn't let all this emotion out before was because she refused to allow Echidna to see her cry anymore. <laughs> but she can though, right? Echidna can see Amelia crying. Like, my canon is whatever happens in, the, in, the, in, the, in this like fucking ruins in the, in the sanctuary, Echidna can see everything. Echidna saw Subaru vandalize it. <laughs> Echidna saw Subaru kissing Amelia. I I'm gonna assume that she sees everything here. Pure stubbornness alone allowed her to suppress her emotions until she was by herself. She also didn't want to show weakness to any of the others either. So this was the only opportunity she would have to mourn her mother's memory. Anyway, that was everything regarding Amelia's trial. All right. The rest of the episode then skips ahead to after the truth of Sanctuary is revealed. But since that's a part of the story that still hasn't been shown yet, I can't really talk about it until that part is finished in the next episode. I'm excited for this backstory too, just like the origins of Roswell. Not L Mathers, but whatever letter 8 Mathers this is, Child Biko and Ryuzu along with Echidna that has not been killed yet, which is, you know, this is like pre-calamity shit. So all the parts dealing with the past of Sanctuary will be covered next week. Until then though, as mm -hmm. always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Mr. Annie News. What was really interesting today? Um, the existence of a second key holder, right? There is another that could be having the key, right? But uh, that person, for whatever reason, is not accessible because they're dead, they're sealed away. Maybe they haven't been transported to this world yet, like Natsuki Subaru. I don't know, but it's not just Amelia that can open this seal. Um, there was a really interesting line about how Amelia's, Amelia believed that her tears are able to like heal or some shit. And I don't know if that's just like a child's delusions or if this is like super important mechanics, but we'll be, we'll, I, I will remember this. <laughs> I will remember the tears of a witch being able to do something. Um, aside from that, what else? I guess this line. It would seem a witch's progeny, which means, you know, a progeny is a descendant, right? Cannot flee from fate, perhaps you were brought to this forest to make sure you, your blood continue to slumber, implying that this situation of Amelia slumbering in this forest because her blood is too dangerous, as you've seen from the powers, right? A same fate was shared with Amelia's ancestor, which could be Amelia's mother, I don't know, but that's very interesting. And then, uh, what else is there? Puck stuff? Like, who the fuck knows what Puck really is? We talked more about the, uh, the timelines of when Puck could have existed. More passages, apparently, from the anime talking about how once Puck used to fucking not have hair and didn't have short limbs to imply that Puck used to be some sort of humanoid that must have existed uh, along with Satala back in the day. If he knows about, you know, the half the shadows of Satala passage against Juice in, like, you know, it's season one content. And then a little bit more just, like, I don't know, just <laughs> poetic bullshit going around with Juice killing Fortuna and then we also getting gaslit in episode 15 about how Subaru you did this to Rem it was love he is love that killed her but that's it we're gonna go to this video but hey please give Mr. Annie News video a like in the video here's the channel and I will see you guys next time